How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. I just want to say first, happy Thanksgiving. And to those brave men and women that are working behind the wall on this day, thank you. Thank you for making it safe so we can celebrate our holidays. And uh, again, our love and appreciation being sent your way. Today, we're going to talk about becoming a mentor. Right now, today, mentors are needed in this profession. We need a way to translate our experience to those that are coming in. And my guest today is going to be Russ Hamilton. It's going to be a great dialogue because both me and Russ have experience in mentoring. And actually, Russ has a great Facebook page called Keepers of Chaos, which introduces people that are new to this profession to people that are senior. And it's great to see the exchange. And I don't know if a lot of the senior staff who are on that Facebook page realize that they are mentoring a lot of new recruits that are taking some really strong tools into the walls of these prisons and jails. But before I introduce Russ and bring him on, let's just go over our sponsors. First sponsor. Oh, my book, Inmate Manipulation Decoded. I hit the wrong one, but we'll start with that first. Inmate Manipulation Decoded. Guys, this is a great book available on Amazon right now. It's used for training all across the country. Uh, if you guys haven't read it, I would recommend you read it. If you're looking to purchase it, the link to that is in the description. And for those who have been purchasing it, Thank you. I truly appreciate the support. Again, Inmate Manipulation Decoded. We also have, let me just get this going, American Military University. If you guys are looking for a degree, seek higher education, please check out American Military University. They're very supportive of what we do in corrections and also very supportive of what we do here on Tier Talk. So again, let's bring some experience into the classroom. So please, if you get a chance, check out American Military University. And we also have my book, how to Succeed in Corrections. Actually, I have it right here. Uh, this book has been published by Blue 360 Media. It's available through them. Uh, so the link to that is in the description. And you just got tons of advice in this book from not just myself, but other professionals in the field. And again, I, I truly believe that book is definitely something you want to have in your hands if you're looking to navigate a successful career in corrections. And very shortly, I have another book that, that's coming out that's going to partner with this book. So this book has about 159 tips, something like that. Uh, and another book I have coming out very shortly, it's got about another 41 tips that's going to complement that book. It's going to add some new tips, but also a different perspective. So a few of the older ones that are in there. I'm proud of that book, the one that's coming out, and that will be out shortly. I'll give you guys more details as we move forward. Uh, but again, that's also going to be published by Blue 360 Media. All right, Russ, what's up? Anthony, how's it going, sir? Good. Hey, hey Russ, you mind introducing yourself to our audience? No, not at all. Uh, my name is, hold on, let me get this. I have it. You still look good all looking, right. Russ. No matter, <laughs> what the, no matter what the angle is, Russ, you got that well, chuck. Yeah. I've got the, uh, I'll tell you, I've, uh, we've had quite the, the month or so here and trying to get uh, everything rearranged and the house is all torn down. So I'm not in my usual uh, haunt there. But anyway, my name is Russ Hamilton. I am um, a former and retired sergeant with California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Um, I am also a former senior juvenile correctional officer. And I currently work for a company where we do reentry and rehabilitation work with inmates at a local county jail where I am the case manager and also a local probation department. And uh, that about wraps it up. Well, Russ, let's, I also want to know if we could just discuss a little bit about Keepers of Chaos, because the discussion today yeah. is, going to be out men, is going to be about becoming a mentor. And I know a big thing of, of, of what you do in Keepers of Chaos on Facebook is you do develop relationships, which allows for uh, senior staff that are connected to your Facebook page to mentor uh, some of the newer boots, or even if people are just moving up, you know, I was a supervisor and now you're stretching into being a supervisor. Uh, maybe I can guide you uh, through my experience. Um, I mean, is mentoring important? How does Keepers of Chaos play into that? Um, so um, the idea behind uh, Keepers of Chaos, first off, is, uh, you know, to be uh, a support page for the professional aspects um, of this job. And uh, the reason that I felt that it was, you know, necessary to uh, make something like that is there were a lot of other places out there, but they were kind of, you know, conglomerations where it was, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of th that. And, you know, 
post meme, 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 memes all day long. And um, they weren't really, you know, focused on taking people um, with, uh, you know, evaluated experience and putting out them out there to answer questions. So, um, so I wanted to be able to address that. And I also wanted to be able to, you know, have a way uh, to drive people as they found, you know, other, um, other venues, you know, on Facebook and so forth, uh, to be able to attract them to places like tier talk, for instance, and, uh, and other places that, you know, were really about, um, advocating for the profession. And so, uh, that's where, um, it all started. And, uh, you know, I just found that, you know, uh, the idea behind mentorship though is, is, you know, it has to be intentional. We have to be able to reach out there and pull those people, um, you know, under our wing and give them the information that they need and teach them how to deal with all aspects of correction, you know, including the mental one, um, because that's, um, really, really very important. And so that's how uh, Keepers of Chaos came about. Yeah, and, and Russ, the reason why I've been kind of doing shows like this recently is because uh, we have lost a lot of senior staff. Uh, we have lost a lot of the experience um, that really only comes from walking the walk. And training, guys, when it comes to corrections, is not just what's taught in the academy, uh, or, or, or taught in general, it's what you observe. And unfortunately, when you have a lot of senior staff that are exiting and out, exiting out, uh, the problem is you don't get a chance to observe how, you know, they roll, you know, some of the untaught lessons that you just kind of passively pick up through time. So what I've been trying to do is fill in that gap because it is a worry for me. I feel that when you don't have proper people to observe, you lose out on the basics. And, and, I, and that, to me, is a very scary thought because everything grows from the basic fundamentals. And there used to be this assumption that people knew the job. They knew these bare essentials. But when you start falling back on those bare essentials, I, I think before you start looking at the individuals, you have to kind of look back and say, well, how did I learn those bare essentials? And then really start to question your own assumptions because, to be honest with you, I think we tend to forget that everything had to have been taught to us. There's a quote by John Wooten, and he says, I think, this is what he says, I think if you truly understand the meaning of mentoring, you understand it's as important as parenting. It's, it's just like parenting. As my father often said, there is nothing you know that you haven't learned from someone else. Everything in the world has been passed down. Every piece of knowledge is something that has already been shared by someone else. If you understand it as I do, mentoring becomes your true legacy. It's the greatest inheritance you can give to others. It's why you get up every day to teach and be taught. See, my biggest thing, Russ, and I would love to just kind of cross into this real quick, is that when it comes to losing out on senior staff, there is a concern where there are things that, that are very simple things that we assume are automatically automatically being done until we find out that they're not being done that isn't being passed down would you would you agree with that yeah you know the the um height and width and breadth and depth of you know all of the little tips um the little tricks um the little pieces of uh knowledge um that we pick up um, you know, not everyone um, is exposed um, to a big enough number of those for them to really necessarily, you know, blossom in this job. You know, I think one of the things that um, I was, uh, you know, blessed with is, is I started work with um, the largest state uh, corrections uh, uh, department in all of the United States. And I went through that and then, uh, you know, became a sergeant. And then I went to one of the smallest um, correctional facilities in the United States. And then on top of that, after I founded uh, Keepers of Chaos, um, you know, I, have, you know, had conversations with, you know, thousands of correctional officers, uh, deputies, uh, detention officers, from all across the United States, um, you know, even even from Europe and even from um, Australia and places like that. And I think, um, you know, having exposure to those things 
um, you know, you get the height, depth, and breadth of all of the evaluated experience from all of those people. And, you know, we have, uh, there's a lot of correctional officers that are um, just out there and maybe they're never going to get to experience um, very much of that because they are in their own small facility and they're never exposed to all of these other ideas. And um, they can be kind of in a stagnant pond, if you will. I'm not saying that, you know, small facilities are bad, but maybe people need more of that exposure. And so that's part of what mentorship is about. It's mentorship, not only at the local level, but, you know, at the global level with what we do here on Tier Talk um, and on Keepers of Chaos. Right. Now, there's a book I'm reading called The Ultimate Guide uh, to Developing Leaders. It's coming from John Maxwell. It's a new book of his. came out in October of 2023. And basically, there is a small section in it uh, that relates toward, towards mentoring, because obviously we know that uh, true success doesn't come alone. You know, you, you have to find someone that you can connect to who has that experience, who can teach you the way. And, and sometimes it's more than one person. I mean, everybody has different skills. And, you know, I, I, I know for me, I've had many people who mentored me in different ways and it helped bring up. A, 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 a better co collective picture of, of what it is that I need to do or be uh, at a management level, but also there were some life lessons. And that's pretty cool about having a good relationship with a mentor because it's not just about the profession. It's a developed relationship that also deals with life lessons. It, it kind of connects to the professional side of it all. I, I think there's a quote in this book, which I love, where it says you must develop the person before you begin developing the leader. And in corrections, the, the goal is we want leaders, uh, whatever level they're at. We want leaders because uh, leaders are decision makers and, and we want them at every level because in corrections, all you're doing every day is making decisions in very novel situations. I mean, it's it, yeah, you got some of the routine, but uh, most of the time we're dealing with very unique situations that requires people just to be able to take the ball and run with it. And uh, I think for me, having a mentor who has, a, like Russ said, evaluated experiences and then shares those, ex those experiences with you is very rewarding. Now, the reason why I wanted to have this dialogue and kind of connect to the other dialogue we had recently about accountability and embracing our rookie staff is because, as I mentioned, it is a concern right now that we're losing senior staff and we really have no one for the rookies to connect to at that highest of levels. So what I'm trying to, to do now is to bridge that gap through a series of these videos, because as I said, I, I know it's a concern, but for me, it's a very scary concern. We are hiring out of desperation right now. And basically, instead of uh, working on cultivating people, a lot of us are working on transforming people. And there's a difference. You know, cultivating was you, you're bringing somebody in that had a spark of potential and then you're connecting them to you know, senior staff who can cultivate that spark. Um, but recently, some of the hires, because we've been hiring out of desperation, are people that they may not have that spark and they may require a whole new foundation. And now when you're connecting them to senior person who is meant to guide them through, it's a lot harder for them to now rebuild uh, this individual in the hopes that they can find a spark. Would you agree to that, Russ? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a critical process, the whole idea about, you know, who is it, um, which pool are we going to try and, you know, uh, get, you know, people into the business from. And so um, kind of uh, corrections to its own detriment has just done this really bad job of just being so far behind the eight ball that they just want to, you know, hire anybody and everybody. And so, you know, they loosen up the requirements. And they just hope to have this huge net and then they bring people in. And some of those people, perhaps a lot of those people um, are really not conducive, you know, to corrections. And, you know, those are the people that end up, you know, going through the training and then um, they just end up, you know, um, leaving. And so what happens to your training dollars, you know, instead of casting these huge nets, why not refine and decide, you know, what the best, uh, you know, possible characteristics are 
of a correctional officer. Um, you know, everything, I mean, and I mean everything, uh, you know, from age to disposition to uh, relevant um, life experience and try and bring those people into the fold because they do bring something innate and of themselves. They bring that spark and uh, that would allow you to not have all of those uh, training dollars just simply frittered away. Um, you know, I often say this job is not for everybody. And if we can find a way to um, to really, you know, tailor those things and find, you know, what makes the best combination of an officer and try and, you know, hunt those things down within our pool that we're, you know, that we're trying to uh, uh, that we're trying to, uh, you know, harvest from, it would be so much better. But corrections, once again, they just hit the panic button time after time after time. And there's things that you have to do um, in order to attract the right personality types. Yeah, and I love what you're saying, Russ, because, you know, we we wait for things to be desperate. And then we totally are just reactionary mode dealing with the immediate as opposed to looking for things as uh, into the long term. You know, um, we knew that uh, there were concerns with retaining correctional staff or inviting people into this profession years ago. Uh, but we waited until it became desperate. And now we learn to accept uh, what's coming our way because we have to. You know, at this point, it's more about numbers to fulfill a, a post as opposed to the quality of, of what it is that we're looking for. And that's scary. Now, in my book, uh, How to Succeed in Corrections, Right here, there's a small uh, passage about discovering a mentor. I just want to go over it real quick and then get your thoughts on this, Russ. The first quote, uh, I do have people that put a quote in before I, I, I do my passage, comes from Bobby Grossman. He's an officer, a retired officer from the Bergen County Sheriff's Department, which is out in Jersey. And he says, I stand on the shoulders of those who train me and I reach back to help and train those behind me. For me, my passage is being a mentor is an investment of time. So it's a commitment centered around the growth and development of two people, the mentor and the mentee. In corrections, having a mentor as a pillar of guidance to help a new hire navigate through this profession is truly invaluable. For me, a mentor in corrections is a person who can help cultivate someone's personal and professional growth around a defined purpose that aligns the profession to perfectly match the mentee's greatest potential. A great mentor doesn't just teach, but rather they guide the mentee by using their own evaluated experiences that have been further defined by their own personal successes and failures throughout their career, and more importantly, even their lives. For me, a mentor-mentee relationship isn't found. It's discovered. The label of mentor-mentee doesn't exist without the proper history and investment of time that establishes the trust which eventually builds and elevates the relationship between the two. For the mentor, can they trust that their investment of time in this potential mentee will serve a greater purpose? More importantly, can the mentor establish value in the life of the mentee? For the mentee, can they trust the guidance of the mentor? Can they trust in their willingness to invest time and help them reach their greatest potential? I enjoyed my time being both the mentor and the mentee, as a mentor, I have found true value in sharing my personal and professional experiences and sharing my understanding of why we do what we do in corrections. This ultimately creates my legacy, which hopefully lives on long after I have left the profession. As a mentee, I was fascinated by the experiences of others. I found true value in understanding the journey of others, understanding their personal and professional growth, and in return, using their stories and experiences to achieve my highest potential. And the greatest impact that can be created in this profession is when we as mentors stand alongside the staff in need, guide them through moments of ambiguity, cultivate their growth in an honest attempt to help them reach their greatest potential. In short, a mentor and mentee relationship defines the true meaning behind the phrase, I am my brother and sister's keeper. Uh, what's your thoughts on all that, Russ? A lot there, but what's your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is a lot there. Um, you know, I think um, one of the things that um, you know we really need to bring the ta to the table, besides having mentors, because you know a mentor is not necessarily um, you know defined by some type of title. 
Um, it's each and every <laughs> officer, um, you know, sergeant, lieutenant, captain that's, you know, already out there in the facility. Um, I know a lot of times, you know, people want to think only of mentors as being your FTO when there's a lot of places that don't even have that. Um, but I think that what we need to um, teach um, to both the mentors and the, and especially though the mentees is, is they need to look at it from that perspective. Uh, they need to realize that they are in, you know, uh, a steep learning curve and they need to, you know, take that seriously and to really, you know, want to, you know, pick up those things that are going to help them through their career, those things that are going to keep them safe, um, those things that are going to, uh, you know, put them ahead of the curve when things are really going bad um, to be able to, uh, you know, deploy uh, the knowledge of other people and make it work for them, but also to evaluate, you know, uh, not every, uh, not every situation is positive. Uh, there's a lot of things that, um, I learned from people who weren't, uh, obviously mentors, uh, but they were, uh, displaying bad characteristics. And I was able to, um, evaluate that and, uh, move myself away from it and understand that not everyone even if they're wearing green or blue or whatever it is, not everyone is your friend in corrections. Yeah. And, and sometimes that lesson uh, uh, takes a second to learn. Uh, it does. I mean, there are, when I came into this profession, uh, I know that there was an overwhelming sense to belong. And there was a part of me that just wanted to connect to everyone because I didn't want to feel alone. Uh, but then I matured and then I realized I can't let my need to belong supersede or or sacrifice uh my my need to connect to the right people uh to make sure i'm going in the right direction especially from day one now uh, day one really matters how you carry yourself on day one trust and believe when you start to move up and when you start to make this a career uh everything you've done in the past uh you know it may define how people look at you so you got to be you got to make sure that you're connecting yourself to the right people uh, throughout this whole journey. So don't let your want to belong uh, truly influence your decision making when it comes to connecting yourself to the right people. Because, again, like Russ said, you may uh, realize that the need to belong superseded logic. And now you're hanging out with people who really aren't professional in their manner. Uh, but at this point, your want to connect to somebody uh, you know, sacrifices, uh, you know, your values. And therefore now you're connecting to the wrong people because you're just looking to connect. Um, so as we move forward in this dialogue, I want you guys to know that this dialogue is both for the people who are looking for a mentor and the people who may be in a position to mentor because it is a developed relationship that has to be received on both ends. And it's a rewarding relationship. And as mentioned before, it's a relationship that really, is an investment. It is an investment, uh, both from the mentor and the mentee. Uh, as a mentor, uh, like I mentioned in there, not only was I happy to share my experiences, but I also learned a lot from my mentee because they're asking questions that make me reevaluate certain decisions that I've made because I want to make sure that I'm able to give them the right answer. I want to make sure that I can give them an answer that truly connects to them. And that's why I think mentor mentee, one of the things about being a mentor and, and teaching is that you're teaching the why behind everything that's being done. And that takes time, but it also requires you to have some insight into your own experiences. So again, you know, if, you, if you're going to cross into that mentor mentee relationship, don't just, you know, look for the, the what or, or the how you know, I, I, you got to teach the why because that's where it brings that connection. For me, the why is a shared, a, a sharing of experiences that truly connect to the individual if delivered and, and, and translated correctly. Now, first off, when you're, when you're looking to become a mentor, you have to kind of, you got you to gotta commit to becoming a developer of people. And again, I'm, I'm kind of reading off the latest John Maxwell book, but this this little section here hit home to me. Russ, this is what he said. He said, we cannot reach our potential without the help of others. No person can. While self-evaluation is valuable, the perspective and assistance of people who are ahead of us 
in life and career are essential to our success. We all have blind spots where we lack self-awareness and only another person can help us by providing another perspective. So if you're a senior staff member and you got a rookie coming in, the first thing you know as a senior staff member is that they're going to need your guidance. So how important is it for us as senior staff to want to commit to the, to the development of our rookies, knowing that. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, you know, we always, that we always phrase things as, is, uh, you know, corrections, you know, being part of a family um, and that thing to try and, you know, take it to um, a higher degree of uh, care over those people that we supervise or affiliate with. Um, in a manner that, you know, we're willing to go in there and risk our own personal safety for them. And so um, if we want those people to share our values, we have to get a hold of them. We have to be willing to mold them. They have to be willing to accept that molding. Um, and if we don't provide, you know, good training and good insights and, uh, you know, a sense of uh, history and things like that, then we're just, uh, you know, short shifting, um, you know, their career because they're not going to develop into the type of uh, staff that we want. And so uh, it's it's really important that we, you know, make that effort. Um, I see I see, unfortunately, lots of times where that effort either isn't being put out or it's just being done in kind of a perfunctory fashion where, OK, this is your FTO report to them. And uh, we're really not, you know, uh, taking things to the level that we could be taking them to. Um, there's, uh, there's always a chance to, to really, you know, up our game and to be more on top of things. And so that's where we should want to, you know, have that at. Um, corrections is never an easy endeavor. <laughs> and so why should we, why should we just be, um, you know, accepting of doing things, you know, at the least common denominator rather than, uh, you know, to the highest fulfillment that we can possibly get. And so um, that alone, if we try and uh, take it from that perspective, will set that bar for those rookies uh, to come in and try and achieve and at least match what we're doing. If we're doing things at the least bottom level, they're never even going to have a concept that there are higher levels out there. And they're just going to you know, rest on um, whatever the lowest denominator always is. And that's why I'm doing these shows, because I feel that you never see like a, a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. You lose out on where it originally was. I know uh, in my 20 something years, I know what I believe to be a high level of, of, of effective prison operations. Uh, but unfortunately, over the last couple of years, we have gradually declined and I've learned to accept it accept things as if that's the highest level of operations. Now, for someone like myself, like Russ, we know where the potential is. But for someone that's new coming in, they only know possibly the potential of where it's at in that moment. So when you don't have good dialogue between senior staff who know what it looks like to be at the penthouse and they know how to translate it, the problem is, like Russ just said, the bar of effectiveness has lowered. So now the rookies that are coming in, what they feel is the penthouse is really just the top of the basement. Uh, does that make any sense for us? Am I, am I, is, is that clear? Yeah, it, I mean, it, it totally is because, um, you know, because just there's a lack, there's a lack of motivation to push toward the top. Um, and that happens for a lot of different reasons. Um, some of it can just be laziness. Part of it's uh, fatigue. Uh, part of it, you know, uh, just the the staffing crisis that we face. And then some of it is, is uh, you know, a lot of people just don't realize what the two, true potential is. You know, you talk about, uh, you know, a copy of a copy of a copy. Um, so, you know, when I get some information from someone who's, you know, a good trainer or whatever, um, and I take a look at what they present to me, and go, okay, this is great. I can apply this. Now, how can I improve it? How can I make this my own? How can I make this part of what, you know, uh, correctional sergeant um, officer Hamilton can do 
and uh, to instead of, you know, pass on just the copy, pass on all of the pages that I add to it. Um, you know, uh, if you're only if you're only developing, uh, you know, knowledge from the past, then it does stagnate and, you know, it starts to fade. Um, you always have to be innovating, trying to find and try new things. And so that's the real beauty of, you know, what a mentorship can be is a mentorship can drive the mentor himself um, to succeed in ways that he or she never thought possible. You know, Russ, that is so spot on. I think there is a balance of uh, growth and development that goes both ways. I think that when I was a mentor and I connected to my mentees, um, they opened me up to uh, a newer uh, perspective. Once I saw that they were able to contribute, though, like once I saw that they were taking the knowledge and they were trying and then they thought, hey, you know what, since I, I, I've been trying these things and you see I, I am producing uh, maybe have you ever thought about doing it this way? And then it's like, wow, you know, I get that respect there because, okay, I'm giving you advice. You're, you're proving yourself to be productive. So therefore now I'm willing to listen to that perspective. And, and what's good about that is from the mentor's perspective, okay, good. This is great. I, I get a chance to see things from a different perspective from the person who's just coming in, who has new eye, who has a, a new line of vision on things. But then also, I'm able to kind of connect with them on the core values that we always have to branch off of, you know. So basically, yes, we we may be looking at this direction, but it's just branches from from the same tree, you know. We're not we're not breaking away from this, and that to me is where my greatest concerns are, and that's why we're doing this show. Is that you know where are we looking at when it comes to being innovative? Like, are, are we going from a strong foundation? where I have enough senior staff instilling experience, knowledge in there and keeping the foundation strong, which allows for a good growth in whatever direction we decide to go. Or we don't have a stable foundation because I don't have senior staff translating that and we're all over the place. You know, I need to be able to try to connect where we're going to that core value of where we have been. And I, and I think that matters too, because it's not about change. I always say it's about evolving, even though sometimes it's interchangeable. I always say it's about evolving because it connects us to those roots. So a mentor is able to keep some level of core values connected at the bottom. And then we're able to be innovative with still holding what we believe, which in my mind is always going to be safety and security. Now, when, when it comes to developing that mentor mentee or just developing people into leaders, uh, the one thing here, I like what John Maxwell says. He says, developing people means adding value to them in any way you can. It means giving people time, attention, advice, and encouragement when they need it. It means making an investment in them without ever expecting anything specific from them in return. And you notice we're saying investment. We're not saying spending time. As a mentor, working with a mentee and vice versa, you're not just spending time with each other. You're investing time. Russ, in your relationships with the people that have mentored you, uh, did you see a difference between the investment of time and the spending of time? Oh, yeah. You know, the um, one thing that, you know, to one degree or another uh, that I tried to be uh, cognizant of is, you know, finding people that can actually pass on uh, good knowledge. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, people out there who, you know, they had something to pass on, but it was more of a, you know, a de minimis uh, type of nature. And then there were other, you know, spot on, you know, officers and sergeants and and lieutenants that really, you know, were able to, you know, capture my imagination and make me think. And, uh, you know, I think that what you have to do as a mentee is you have to become very eclectic. You have to, uh, you know, find those people that can pass on the best parts of knowledge to you, you know, and find that person, that individual that's, oh, they know all about gangs. This other person knows about, you know, combat handcuffing. This other person, you know, uh, you know, they know about uh, firearms. This other person knows about transportation. This other person knows about contraband interdiction. And uh, to take all of those things and be able to absorb them in a manner that then you're able to take and apply them. And so, uh, you know, not everybody, uh, not everybody passes on 
really truly uh, useful knowledge, information, or wisdom. Um, you have to be the purveyor uh, of those people and find the ones. You just go and ask. You know who, who's really great at gangs or whatever. And so, but it has to be up to you to be able to uh, find those individuals and pay attention to what it is that they bring to the table. And Russ, I, I know you probably, I don't know if you read this book, but you're actually uh, literally jumping into what he, he says. He says that uh, for someone becoming a mentor, he says, as you prepare to become a developer of people. So he calls it a developer of people, but I, but I could equate that to mentor. Uh, you need to think about what you have to offer. The more wisdom and experience you have as a leader, the better your potential is to invest in others by developing them. But even if you're relatively inexperienced, as long as you are open, authentic, learning and growing, you'll be able to develop others. To gauge where you currently stand, you got to ask yourself these three questions. But uh, before I ask those questions, uh, I want I want to mention something where it says uh, when you're inexperienced, as long as you're open, authentic, learning and growing. This is true. I have mentored people who have asked me some really good questions in which I didn't know, um, but I was challenged by them and I had continued to grow. So what I was doing is I was kind of just looking for knowledge. I got leadership books. I got whatever I could pull out. And then what was great was I read the books, partnered with my experience, and then I'm able to provide a very good perspective to the person asking that question. It's crazy because I'll read a book I say two years ago, and then I'll read the same book two years later, and my growth will interpret the book a bit differently. Uh, you know, so it's always good to revisit a book as long as you're continuing to growing in between. But having said that, you know, if there are things that you may not know, and you know, yeah, you could always direct them to other people, and that's always an option. Don't 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 minimize that. Of course, that's a great idea. You know, knowing what you don't know is is truly one of the best things you could do in a leader's position. I mean, saying, I don't know, but let me help you find the answer. But also, like, if I don't know and I feel like it should be within my strengths, I'm going to invest time in it, and then I'm going to go back and try to utilize what I've learned, mold it with my experience, and then translate that to the mentee in a way that they find value. And I think that's cool about the relationship between a mentor and a mentee is how challenging it can be both ways, as long as you as a mentor go in knowing that it's okay to not know something. I mean, that's the key. I mean, it is a developed relationship. So one of the three things uh, before you become a mentor uh, to somebody, because again, it's not just thinking, okay, I got the position, so I could definitely be a mentor. So I'll give you an example. Russ is a sergeant. Someone walks up to Russ and says, Russ, could you be my mentor? And if Russ goes, well, I was a sergeant. Sure, I could be your mentor. It's more than just that. It's not just about your position. So the first question you're going to ask yourself, Russ, and I would love your insight on this, is if if you're looking to be a mentor, so let's say, Russ, I want to learn from you. You believe I have potential. You believe this is going to be a worthy relationship, a, a great exchange between us both. So you want to take this seriously. This is something that you want to take seriously. The first question you ask yourself, so I go to Russ and I say, hey, Russ, I know you're a sergeant. I'm looking to become a sergeant. Would you like to mentor me? Now, Russ looks at me and says, wow, this kid, I, I, I know is going to make something out of his career. I know if I invest in him, he's going to wind up doing something with the time I spent. So the first question you should ask yourself, Russ, before you take the mentor role is, what is your level of credibility? So what does that mean? So I think your level of credibility really has a lot to do with um, what your reputation is. Um, and number two, with um, the way that you've been observed by staff, including this individual, um, as far as uh, the things that you've done, the roles that you've taken on, uh, the conditions under which you've operated, and uh, most of all, uh, the adversities and dangerous situations that you've faced, and uh, that you have a way to be able to uh, take those things which are viewed in a good light. Um, but be able to do more than just, you know, act in that capacity, but be able to pass those things that you did on um, in a way that uh, people can absorb them. Um, you know, I've I've seen, you know, people that were really great at doing things uh, that weren't necessarily good teachers. Uh, they weren't necessarily able yeah, to true. pass on and even necessarily understand uh, why they were so good at what they did. 
I mean, they were great at doing it, but they couldn't begin to explain to you um, what they did or why they did it. You know, you know, Russ, you are so spot on because I think when it comes to the mentor relationship and mentee, uh, definitely the credibility. I mean, you know, I, I need someone who I know is is effective at what they do. Um, but also, uh, besides respect, because I think credibility comes with the respect of, of what you have done, because it is a relationship that needs to be accepted both ways, I think you have to like the individual. I, I do. I, I truly do think that if you want to have a relationship that's beneficial between you and, and the mentor and also mentor to mentee, there's got to be a mutual, it goes beyond respect. There's got to be uh, a fact that we get along with each other. Um, that we're able to connect uh, and trust each other. I, again, uh, because it is a developed relationship, it also is an investment of time. You're going to be spending time with each other. Uh, if you don't like each other, it just makes for a very awkward interaction that doesn't allow an environment to be conducive uh, for this level of investment. Uh, he also states credibility, exactly what Russ said. Credibility is everything to the people you desire to develop. No one asks to be coached by a person who's never demonstrated success no one seeks business advice from a person who never runs a successful business. No one gets fitness instruction from someone who is out of shape. And no one asks a mediocre speaker to coach them in communication. It just doesn't make sense. Now, granted, if you're the mentor and someone does request that uh, for you to be uh, to be their mentor, you got to ask yourself, uh, like Russ said, are you credible and are you effective in these areas? And it, and it doesn't hurt to go back and ask the potential mentee, you know, why are you choosing me? You know, what are the things that I have done that connect to you that you feel that I can I can teach you, I, I can share with you? The second question, Russ, is will my strengths contribute to theirs? So I, I, I don't want to, I'll read Maxwell's stuff later because you seem to be spot on already. I don't want to influence your thoughts. So if, 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 if as a mentor, the second question was, you know, the first question again, what's my level of credibility? The second question is, will my strength contribute to theirs. And, and and I love these questions, by the way, because they're insightful on the mentor. They're basically making sure the mentor is able to fulfill the challenges of taking on a mentee. But Russ, what does that mean to you? Will my strengths contribute to theirs? So I think that, um, you know, the, the strengths that you have, um, whether they're uh, natural attributes or whether they're something that, uh, you know, you've cultivated because you've gone out and sought that knowledge for yourself are these things uh, that you're going to be able to pass on going to be beneficial to them um, i think that if you're even asking that question though the chances are yes that that is probably going to be the case um, i think that you know we don't want to we don't want to spend time where we're not the one to develop this individual maybe someone else would be better at it um, but if you are a well-rounded, uh, corrections professional, you know, and you bring a lot of different skill sets to the table, um, even if you're a jack of, uh, all, of all trades and master of none, there's still a lot of things that you can always pass on. So, I, but I think we just have to be, you know, cognizant of the fact that, am, am I a good fit? Can I really do much more for this person than they've already done? Um, I mean, if this person is just, you know, uh, heads and shoulders above and beyond you and everyone else, um, you know, maybe you're not the best fit. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't think that you can't have something to contribute. I think it just has to be something that you evaluate because we want to do the best. We want to do the best possible thing for whoever this individual is. I agree, Russ. And I'm going to also, I want to top off on something that he also mentions in here, and it's obviously in agreement with what you're saying, Russ. He says, before you engage in mentoring a mentoring relationship, it's, it's important that you know this truth. We teach what we know, but we re reproduce who we are. The reason development is so powerful is that good leaders possess the ability to reproduce their abilities in the lives of the people they develop, but that is only possible if the developers and those they develop share similar strengths. It's fine to admire talented and accomplished people. 
It's great to partner with them if there's something you can accomplish together. But if you don't have common strengths, a mentoring relationship isn't going to be highly successful. The leader will become frustrated and the person being developed won't be capable of executing what the leader teaches. So begin developing others by focusing on using your strengths to develop similar strengths in them. You don't need to try to be all things to someone. You develop, uh, we all need multiple mentors and coaches. But think about this, Russ. I I know where my areas of strength are, uh, especially as I matured in this profession. Uh, I believe that I was promoted to higher positions because I excel in certain areas, but I'm also humble enough to know where other people can compliment me. I know the things that I'm not good at, and I have no problem telling people I'm not good at those things. But when someone comes up to be mentored by me, I make sure that I fulfill or I have the strengths to fulfill what it is that they're looking for. And usually the people that come up to me, like Russ said, they've observed something. They connect to it. Uh, so it is something usually that, you know, maybe they like uh, how I interact with people, my management of people. So they come up and they say, hey, Gans, you know, I love how you, you know, you manage the team. Uh, do you think that's something that you can help me with? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, because, again, I may look at this person. I say, you know what? And I, I like how you are also uh, act with the team. I like how the team looks to you already as an emerging leader. So here we are. I got my strengths. I see the potential for this person to develop strengths within my areas of giftedness. So this is a great relationship right, to, right from the get-go. Who does not want to teach with their, within their areas of giftedness to someone who can now maybe take the torch? Because that's the key. Remember that, guys. Mentoring and mentee is you're passing the torch. I mean, this is a great way to create a legacy. I could just imagine this. Right? Someone walks up to you and says, man, I love how you do searches, Russ. And then you look at that person you're like, and I've seen how this guy does searches. This guy's got the potential to be great. How much does that now want you to get involved uh, with this person? Yeah, you know, I think that when you when you have, you know, a specific uh, skill set that you actually, you know, excel in and, uh, you know, you share a common bond, you know, with, the uh, you know, the love of actually, you know, doing something and someone else wants to get involved in that someone else, you know, comes and, and, uh, you know, they have, uh, they've shown that they have, you know, a particular, you know, spark of talent in that area and they want to pick your brain. I mean, it's, it's really flattering, you know, and I think it's, you know, something that, you know, then, you know, we can use that, you know, to motivate us, um, to really even go further than we've gone with our own skill set and develop it even more. And uh, sometimes that individual, you know, sparks things in you um, that you realize, hey, you know what, I could have taken I could have taken this thing even further. And now I really have a chance to, to show them um, the ins and outs, you know, and uh, especially when it's especially when it's not just idle curiosity. You know, I have had, I've had people that approach me, oh, I want to I want to be able to search. And, you know, they didn't really, they didn't really want to. I always tell, I always tell people, I don't teach you how to search. I teach you how to find. And mm. they really didn't have an aptitude for it. And they really didn't want to learn. Um, they wanted a fast, easy path <laughs> to be able to, um, to be able to, you know, do something, but they, they didn't have a level of commitment to it. And I had other people, you know, that did have a level of commitment uh, to it and they wanted to be able to make a difference and they really wanted to be able to um, to go out there and do it and those are the ones that would, would that would flourish um, but either way I, I took it as a compliment because you know I would I would be involved in things and people would just man they would just say you know I, I don't understand how you saw that and how you understood what was going on and I would break it down for them and then they would be able to take that lesson away and uh teach it to people you know even today you know even though i've even though i've been out of uh i've been out of adult corrections for uh you know 10 years now so um but it's i mean but it's an honor to, to really to me to teach people who want to learn and especially with uh especially with the skill sets that i consider myself to have excelled in and that's powerful i mean it's two things though too it's it's one, yes, being able to recognize um, someone's potential in those areas, but then also see that other people see you within your area of giftedness. 
and recognize that. And that's got to be something that you feel inside as well. Like, you know, when someone comes up and says, hey, Russ, man, you are an amazing uh, uh, per- uh, searcher. You know, I mean, you really know how to find stuff, discover contraband. And I think when that's within your area of giftedness and someone recognizes it, it hits home. You know, so yeah. I, I think that also elevates you as well. And um, the other thing he mentions is what experiences outside my strengths can I give them? And if I just may start off with this real quick, I find myself to be a good problem solver. And the reason why I'm a good problem solver is because I know I don't have the answers, uh, but I'm able to take advantage of my resources. Uh, that That's the key. I'm not afraid for conflict. That means if I have to bring people to the table to discuss concerns, we're going to do that. Um, but I think that my um, my areas of, of, of um, ex- what experiences outside my strengths can I give them? I think for me is because I've continued to learn. I have no problem uh, recommending books, uh, recommending friends of mine who are also experienced those areas. I mean, Russ gets it all the time where I got a friend of mine, let's say, or someone that follows the show that sends me an email about, you know, having some concerns with uh, equipment or you know, uh, uh, finding contraband, whatever, whatever it is, that's for us. Someone got concerns about working with medical. That's for Connie. I mean, I, I think a big part of this part right here as a mentor is understanding what you don't know and then having the, uh, you know, the ability to now pa- pass, pass it to somebody else who uh, is able to help that person better uh, than you could. Uh, because again, you may have inexperience in that area. I mean, and, and Russ, one one other thing too. Um, I think one when I interviewed for administration, when I didn't know an answer, I showed them how how resourceful I was in finding out the answer, which was really about bringing people to the table and opening the discussion, but letting people know that I don't have the answer to this. I think one thing as a mentor is you have to be able to recognize. Uh, what's in your position to answer and what's in your position that eh, this this may not be for me. Uh, and, and John Maxwell says here, become a facilitator of experience for them. Give them books to read. Send them to classes or seminars. Connect them to other leaders with strengths you lack. Much of people's development is hands-on. You must be willing to give your personal time and effort to it, but you can arrange some of it for people using resources you possess at your disposal. I mean, what's your thoughts on that, Russ? Uh, yeah, you know, the um, we tend to think of, you know, the mentorship role as uh, being, you know, only interpersonal. Uh, but, you know, it's it's not just that it's, uh, you know, being able to, uh, you know, decide, hey, this person, um, I'm I'm taking them under my wing. I'm teaching them things. I'm doing what I can to pave the path for them. But I also know that, you know, there's uh, an abundance of outside resources uh, you know, training and things that they would benefit from things that they don't know about things that they don't know how to access. And, um, therefore I am the gateway to that. I am the person that is able to maybe set that up or at least tell them, Hey, you know what, you should go check out this, uh, you know, this, uh, seminar on, uh, deescalation or, or whatever it is and, uh, get them to open their eyes to just how, big the world of corrections is, uh, how many different um, skill sets there are, how many different opportunities, how many different, um, you know, uh, specializations that they can get into. And uh, by doing that, um, you're doing more than just, uh, you're doing more than just uh, giving them what they want at that moment in time. You're making them aware of the things that they should want in the future. Yeah. And he says, as we start to sum up our discussion, this, these are these are just some little final bullets. He says, you know, being a mentor is different than being a coach. He said, these are a couple of things. Russ, I'm going to riddle off the list. And if you, uh, when the list is done, you know, if you have any thoughts on anything, let me know. Um, so difference between coaching and mentoring. Coaching is skill-centered. Mentoring is life-centered. Coaching is, a, is usually done in a formal setting. Mentoring is done in an informal setting. Coaching is usually more structured. Mentoring is less structured. Coaching is directive. Mentoring is advisory. Coaching is short-term. Mentoring is long-term. Coaching is narrow in scope. Mentoring is broader in scope. Coaching drives the agenda. Mentoring receives the agenda. 
Coaching is positional. Mentoring is relational. Coaching is about skill awareness. Mentoring is about self-awareness. Coaching trains. Mentoring develops. Coaching is to do something. Mentoring is to be something. And coaching is transactional. Mentoring is transformational. Uh, any any of these uh, kind of kicking some insight for you, Russ? Yeah, you know, I just think that... Um... I think they're just understanding the uh, the platform of of being a mentor and, you know, how all encompassing it is and that, you know, uh, coaching is just something where, you know, you don't get to pick your coach. You do get to pick your mentor. Um, and uh, as mentors, you know, uh, we also um, we also, though, we don't necessarily get to pick who it is that we want to mentor because we have a higher responsibility uh, to our organization to do what we can for just about everybody, you know? And so I think that, it, you know, that viewpoint of what it is that a mentor brings to the table is, uh, is, you know, it's kind of just, you know, an awesome thought to believe that, you know, down through the ages, the things that I teach someone today that they're going to pick up and teach to someone tomorrow uh, and that person that they've taught is going to pass down, uh, you know, something that I've taught years and years ago, and they may never even know your name. They may never even understand that, you know, it was a concept that you brought to someone, uh, but you made a difference. Uh, you made a difference that maybe uh, changed someone's career path, um, that changed someone's life, that saved someone's life. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's that whole host of, uh, you know, differences right there is, is just fascinating. <laughs> I think that yeah. there's a, uh, I think that there's, you know, a, a point at which, you know, in some cases, um, you know, uh, the coaching is a little bit more like maybe what they do, um, at the Academy, but the mentorship is, uh, much more of a, um, you know, it's much more of a voluntary relationship that's uh you know doesn't have uh those elements of being uh formalized necessarily and it's funny as i look back and watch rocky rocky uh mickey really was a coach he wasn't a mentor you know i just want to let you guys know that because he's really you know wants rocky you know to fight and and and, and basically he doesn't really get involved so much with the the life concerns of of what rocky is going through especially when his wife goes into the coma and you know i mean yes it's someone that he does have respect for, but he is the coach. I mean, a hundred percent, he's a coach to Rocky. For me, if I could just add something here, uh, mentoring really involves you knowing the person. I mean, that's the key of it all. I mean, you can't really help somebody um, uh, in regards to their life, uh, in regards to um, building a relationship with them, in regards to self-awareness, in regards to helping them become something, and in regards to transforming them some, into something is because you got to know them. If you don't know who that person is, there's no way you're going to be able to achieve these things in a manner that's beneficial for that individual. Again, if you don't know what that person wants to be, uh, I don't think you're in a position to instruct them where they need to be. I, I, I disagree with that. I think you need to understand from their perspective where they want to be, you know, who they want to be. And then you always work from their, their perspective. And I, and my favorite one out of here is directive versus advisory as, as a mentor, um, you are given a lot of advice uh, and, and you're not really given direction. You're given advice because at the end of the day, there's multiple ways uh, to get to where they want to go. And usually you provide them with the advice and you see if they have the courage to take it. And the cool thing about that is once you start seeing them heading in that right direction and you start seeing them being productive based on the advice you're providing, it does become re more rewarding for the mentor now because now they see that the fruits of their efforts as well is, is being heard. I, I think it's the greatest compliment in the world when you provide somebody with advice, not a directive, an advice, which means that they have the choice now to either go one way or the other. You're not telling them, you're giving them advice. And the advice, again, is based on what their needs are. And then when they take your advice, uh, to me, it's the most rewarding thing in the world. That's the legacy. That's passing it off. Uh, one last thing here. Be, being a mentor, he, he, he has a couple of qualities here 
uh, that I think hits home. And I just want to mention them real quick. We talked about um, the difference between mentoring and coaching, but he also mentions uh, for the person that's becoming a mentor, you got to have a great attitude and that's a choice, you know, and it's tough in this profession right now because we have a lot of negativity, um, but we could change or choose our, our attitudes and how we face the negativity. Uh, we could go in with a trap mindset where this is how it's always going to be or have some hope, realistic hope that things will turn around. But if you have a negative mindset, to be honest with you, I really don't think you're in a position to mentor individuals because, again, part of being a mentor is providing people um, with, you know, helping them through the challenges and not just becoming disenfranchised by it. That's a big thing, guys. That's why I did a show recently. Uh, sometimes we get so defeated by this gradual decline uh, that we've accepted it and we, we lose out on accountability. And once you start losing out on accountability, things get worse. So you got to be able to know that there, the effort matters more than the outcome. You have to keep on producing the effort, keep on producing the effort. And attitude is a choice. Um, there's power in proximity. So basically being close to someone as a mentor has a lot more weight because you can create an impact as opposed to trying to impress them from a distance. Uh, go to places that inspire you. I think this is great. If I have a chance to spend time with my mentee outside of work, I make sure we pick a nice place that's inspiring and that gives us a chance to communicate and not a place that's busy and just too many distractions. This is literally quality time between you and the person you're choosing a mentee. Uh, you have to be the first to see the potential in that individual. And that's not always easy. But again, like we, we talked about it before, if I see someone that, you know, came up to me because they were inspired by my ability to manage people or solve problems, whatever it is that I, that I may excel at, I, in return, would, would have to see their potential in it. And that's where we talked about cultivating versus transformation. Transformation is you're going to have to try to dig and find it and build it. Where cultivating is you already have a spark. I just, I just got to see where I have to kind of turn that into a flame. Uh, for me and Russ, we've done this. Um, I'd love to get Russ's thoughts real quick on this one is expand your influence behind, uh, beyond your personal touch. For me, the YouTube channel and the books I write, uh, what, what about you, Russ? What about, how do you mentor people that you'll probably never meet? Uh, yeah. So obviously, uh, one thing that we really do have working for us in this day and age are these, uh, social media platforms. Uh, but none of them are easy, um, you know, uh, but it's the best way, I think, uh, to be able to get out there and to touch bases with people. Um, you know, it, it's not easy being the, quote, social media influencer. Uh, you know, some of the things that I've been through with regard to that are very, um, uh, I would say, just eye opening, as it were. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, this platform really gives us a chance uh, to bond and make contact with people who otherwise uh, would never come into the sphere of our influence and we would never come into the sphere of their influence. And I think that it's a really good thing because, um, you know, it just means that the height and depth and breadth of the talent out there um, can be shared in ways that it was never possible before. Yeah. And, th and that's true. I mean, again, I mean, uh, the videos, Russ's keepers of chaos page is just, it's also humbling too, because when that page was put together, Russ <laughs> knew that he's also, it's not about, you know, I'm the leader of this group. Russ literally sits back in a circle of equals mm -hmm. and they all kind of, cross into the areas of expertise, but then also Russ has a humbleness about him where Russ also knows he continues to grow in his areas of giftedness. So he doesn't take a challenge if someone disagrees with them, as long as it's a disagreement that's respectful and built on trust, as opposed to I'm just disagreeing with you because I just want to attack you, Russ, because we've had that. We've had people that have disagreed, but it wasn't because of the thought. It's because I just want to attack Russ. And it's like, okay, well, I'm sorry. We don't got time for that. But then you get people you do respect who it's okay to disagree with them. It's okay to have conflict because there's a trust underneath. We know we're trying to get the best information out there. So we know conflict helps us grow. So having said that, Russ also has known to sit back, like myself too, where we're not always right. You know, we're developing discussions, but we're not always 100% right. I mean, this is literally 
a trial and error sometimes. But having said that, to know that you're going in humble. And, and that's why I think Russ's platform, Keepers of Chaos, continues to grow because uh, I think Russ is kind of also the last person to speak in some of those cases where there's questions. Russ likes to see what everybody else has to say first and then go ahead and give his input based on where uh, the discussion is headed. A couple of little small things. It says, become your mentee's champion. I've always done that. I believe that if I am going to mentor somebody, I want to put them in challenging situations where I know it could be failure or success, but there is always guidance there. Uh, and I am going to defend them. Uh, if there's a if there's a bad decision made, I'm going to stand behind them. I'm going to do what I can to make sure uh, that the people I, that the people that are around me and and the people that could influence uh, this person's ability to move up are aware of, of this person's great potential. And that's the key, guys. When you're promoted into a position, it's it, it really not so much of the technical; it's your potential to take the next step, carry the baton with excellence, uh, and then um, have a vision. So you and the mentor and mentee should have a vision, uh, something that you want to go towards and your behaviors need to co co uh, align with that vision, uh, especially if it's shared values. Remember, it's a shared partnership in each other's growth and development. And then a little something rewarding for the mentor is that when you help others get what they want, eventually they will help you get what you want. And I have seen that with the people I've mentored uh, because in return, uh, if I need something, they're also behind me, uh, pushing me forward when I feel less motivated. Cause let's be honest guys. I mean, it's hard to kind of stay motivated, but we know we have to. So as long as we're open, we're allowed to have bad moments, but they're usually fleeing. You know, we're not in a state of, of, of depression. It's just more of, it's a bad day and we're allowed to have those, but as long as you know, it's never permanent. Um, and then the last, the last thing here, guys, um, usually why some leaders uh, or some people don't choose to pa uh, uh, mentor individuals or empower them is because they may not be aware that, you know, they can do this or, or that there's people out there uh, that are worthy of, 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 of their mentorship and vice versa. Uh, the lack of time, just remember, guys, people come first. I don't care if you're busy, if, if you got all these tasks coming your way. Remember, people are your greatest assets. Always find time to meet with your people because if you're getting so overwhelmed with work that you can't meet with your people, the problem is you're going to start disconnecting with them. So people are always your priority. Uh, and when it comes to inability to find someone to develop, that does take time and investment. So you have to know your people, know where their greatest potential, know who has the greatest potential that's worthy of your, of your time. And, and it's funny because... Maxwell said in a book prior, um, e everybody you lead is going to be worthy of your love. It's like an unconditional love, but not everybody's worthy of your time. And I thought that was uh, pretty, pretty unique. Um, you have to believe in others. And are you going to mentor people that uh, <laughs> don't uh, reach uh, the level of expectation that you want them to reach? Yes. Uh, but you can't let that disenfranchise you from not mentoring people again. I mean, that's the key. Hey, Russ, on the last thoughts uh, before you close, or before we close, these are some things that they say helped him become a mentor. And I thought this was good. Uh, just some thoughts that when you're becoming a mentor, uh, these are some of the things that um, people look for. They look for consistency. They look for faithfulness. They look for people who can reflect on their experiences. They look for people who are professional in their duties. They look for people who can be creative and innovative within their areas of giftedness. They look for humility. Like I said, a, 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 you know, I don't know something is, is a level of vulnerability that should be rewarded now. It's not something that you should be afraid to say. It, it, a vulnerability in, in, in leadership and what it is, it should be something that's rewarded because we're not looking for perfection, uh, which tends to be an unrealistic expectation. We're looking for humbleness. I think that me and Russ have talked on this platform many times about no one's perfect and you need to admit when you don't know something so we can get ahead and work together to fix it, as opposed to thinking that if you admit you don't know something, you're weak. Um, you got to maintain joy in this profession, especially as a mentor. Uh, you got to give someone um, uh, a level of fulfillment letting them know that this job is very rewarding. I mean, the funny thing is you're not looking to be happy because you're not going to be happy every day, but you are looking to be fulfilled, which means I could have a bad day, but it doesn't make my work any less fulfilling. 
Um, perspective. I mean, that's the cool exchange about being a mentor and a mentee is that there are different perspectives. Uh, you know, my perspective may be different than yours and vice versa, but we can learn from each other by let me lean into your perspective and then you'll lean into mine and we, we kind of grow together. Um, focus that kind of goes with commitment, having that vision, which we talked about reciprocity. Now what they mean is, is, is kind of like, you know, as, as a mentor, it's not that I expect it, but when you're there for somebody, uh, there does become some level of obligation. That person is going to be there for you. Not that you're going to expect it, but it, it, it happens guys. Again, my mentees have been there for me, just like I've been them for the, there for them. And that really is um, a great benefit of having this relationship. It, it truly is the brother, sister, keeper thing we talked about. Uh, creating opportunities, uh, servanthood. It, it is a level of, of, of uh, when you're a mentor, it is, it is all about the person that you are trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, have them reach their greatest potential. And then intentionality, uh, mentoring in and, and teaching people the way, all that stuff is an intentional effort. And so is learning. Learning is an intentional effort. If, if you're not seeking to learn every day, uh, one is you won't grow and develop, obviously, but you'll never be in a position to help others. So again, it is constant learning. And by the way, constant learning isn't just in the hours you're working. It's on some free time. If you have a chance picking a book up and read it, especially if you're going to be in a position to influence others, if you're going to be in a position to influence others, if you're going to be in a position to teach others, what are you doing to grow yourself first? Because if, if you stop growing, uh, then you're not going to be in a position to grow others. Uh, and, and one other thing before we get into closing, when you know what's good about mentoring and mentee, if you when it went to that one question about mentoring and, 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 and building that relationship based on strengths, you know what's really good about that? So if I have, let's say, my abilities, I, I, I think are, are, are not, not as tactical as, as I would like them to be. Uh, they're a little bit more generalized in scope. So I do lean on my on my my front line a lot because I feel that they're able to translate my my strategy to my, my strategy at a higher level to something more tactical. Uh, that's why I definitely do need them. Um, but being able to have that strength uh, and then being able to find someone who knows how to balance that, even as a mentee, whatever it is, it's great because when they're specific in what they're trying to learn and it matches with my strengths, their questions become very challenging, which helps me grow because they're already at a certain level. They're not very simplistic. They're in their area of giftedness. So they're asking questions that are very evolved. Uh, and I find that to be very welcoming because then it gives me a chance to look back and step up my game as long as I'm willing to do so. And the reason when I know our game is truly stepping up is when we have our discussions, our discussions are going like this. It's never I'm here and the person asks the question that's up here and then I remain down here. I got to go here and we got to keep going up until we get to a point where we connect. Uh, hey, hey, Russ, anything you'd like to say in close? I thought this was a great dialogue, uh, you know, but I would just love to hear your your thoughts on the importance of uh, mentoring and being a mentee and all this good stuff. The really important thing that I think to take away from it is, is if you're out there right now and, you know, and you have, you know, some level of professionalism, some, some level of skill, um, find a way to pass that on. You know, uh, you may not be ready to, you know, take things on in a mentorship role yet, but that doesn't mean that um, you can't pass on some things. That doesn't mean that you can't uh, motivate and cultivate yourself to become ready for a bigger and deeper role. Um, you know, I think one of the, one of the things that, um, I never, never envisioned was, um, the growth, um, that was going to happen, uh, from keepers of chaos and from tear talk and those things and being able to, you know, remain, uh, you know, in the profession in sort of a sidelined way, uh, but yet to be able to bring so much, uh, more to it. And to really impact it in ways that I never envisioned. I never, I never thought I was going to be a, you know, a social media influencer. I never thought I was going to be, you know, uh, that I was never going to be, you know, uh, doing videos or being asked to be on, uh, you know, some of these uh, programs, podcasts, and the other things that I've done. Um, 
So you never know what opportunities may present themselves. Be open to it and understand that corrections needs you. Corrections needs people to, you know, uh, to step in and fill the gaps and bring the training and bring the wisdom and bring the direction. Uh, because, uh, you know, to be quite frank, you know, corrections is it's full of conflict. Um, it's full of danger. And, uh, you know, anything that we can do to bring those levels of things down so that everybody can manage it better um, is going to be a win for us all. So uh, just because you don't envision yourself as a mentor right now doesn't mean that that may not be what the future holds for you. I love that. And I want to mention something, Russ, you got me thinking real quick. So Tear Talk has been around for over a decade now, started on the radio, and Russ was my third guest. Um, I, 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 he really was. He was my third guest. Uh, he was my uh, first guest that wasn't an author because my first guest was Gary Cornelius, uh, and then I believe it was Keith Helwig, and then uh, it was Russ. And the reason why Russ became my guest was because back in the day on Facebook, I didn't know what Russ looked like, still didn't know what Russ looked like when I had him on the radio because he had a picture of this guy with a, just a huge chest. There was no face. I don't know if you remember this, Russ, but this was your picture for quite some time on Facebook. And um, it was just this big guy. But your comments were so, like your writing skill, just how you presented it. And I was like, man, uh, this guy, to me, uh, was a genius, uh, especially within these areas of contraband. And I, and, and I knew uh, the audience needed that. And that was the first time where I'm thinking like, you don't, you don't need someone who has to have a book out there. You, you need someone who's literally in the profession, walking the walk. And at that time, you were still in the profession. You, you hadn't retired yet. We're going back uh, probably about uh, maybe 2011, 2012. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I respected uh, one uh, uh, right off the bat how you wrote and how you expressed it. But then when we got a chance to get to know each other you know, how you were able to kind of tell me that you lived it. Like you weren't just commenting things to comment. I mean, this is truly knowledge that's coming from your ability and, and efforts to, to push forward. Even if it was going to be a bad decision, I'll, I'll, let's roll it out. Let's see uh, where it goes. I mean, that's the key, right? Having courage to make decisions, whether they're right or wrong, uh, you know, just giving something 110% effort. And, uh, I envied you a lot, uh, not not jealous because I was never jealous because I knew um, when I was doing the radio show, I knew where my areas of strength were to some extent already. Um, and I knew it wasn't in those areas, but I wanted that. Don't get me wrong. I wanted that. Uh, I definitely didn't have it uh, like you had it, um, but I wanted that. But I also realized that, you know what? Um, I have Russ. So like, you know, again, this is going back a while ago, but the decision was already made that I'm never going to be that guy. And it's not because I don't want to be, and it's not because I don't think they're needed. They're more needed than anything that I could ever do. I just knew it wasn't within my areas of expertise. So the moment I had Russ uh, in, in, in the discussions, I, I was able to kind of step back and focus on other things because I knew I had Russ in the wings that could complement where my areas were weak. And then now, as we move forward, I'm guaranteeing you that Russ and myself are a lot better than where we were 10 or 12 years ago because we found a niche, we shared the niche, and sometimes people ask us questions that make us grow uh, within our own areas of giftedness because we never saw something from that perspective. But it is all balancing out. It, it, it's knowing where your strengths are, knowing where your weaknesses are, and knowing where you could be most effective for somebody and knowing where you can't. And uh, I think that was a lesson that that Russ taught me because, again, having Russ come on the show and discuss things in a manner where I could never discuss it. But the biggest concern is when it comes to a platform like Tear Talk, the reason why it's so long lasting is when you know when to step away and know that these aren't your areas of expertise, you bring somebody on who not only speaks on those areas of, of expertise, but is willing to take the challenges because they've walked it. That's the key. That's the key to anything that when you go on a public platform, even myself, when I go on the news, I got to make sure I'm so comfortable in that area that I could deal with the challenges, the naysayers, and, and just be able to speak with confidence. That's why I'm never nervous when I go on 
because I, I, I get the urge. I want to speak because I'm within, I'm within my area of expertise and I've earned it. I've earned it because this is my area of expertise. Uh, so again, having someone like, like Russ on the platform who also has his areas of expertise and welcomes the challenge because we go on wanting someone to disagree with us. That's the weirdest thing. Because here's the cool thing about that. If someone disagrees with us and we are wrong, we can learn from it. And that's fine. It's not personal. Or if we are right, it gives us a chance to reinforce what we have to say. So it turns out to be beneficial both ways. Uh, but I, I just wanted to add that. As always, guys, the show is here. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post up a video. And by the way, my my room here looks like a cell. So maybe when, when, when Russ comes back in, uh, from New Jersey, you can see where I hide all my contraband. As always, guys, <laughs> take care. Stay safe.